I hope that song stirred your affections for Christ this morning. I hope that worship has stirred your affections for Christ and one another this morning. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship. For this gathering of believers today to lift up your name, to hear your word spoken. But I pray, Lord, as we open up your word and we look at your scriptures, that these are the holy scriptures. These are not my scriptures. These are not my words. These are not my ideas. These are holy, heavenly, Christ ideas. So Lord, as we open up your scripture, as your word is spoken today, that your Holy Spirit would rest heavy on us. That our affections would be stirred for you as we press into your word and to one another. It is in your name that we pray all of these things, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there's a great debate among church people who just like to debate about church things. What's better to preach on and teach on? Is it an expository study or a topical study? And over the last many, many weeks, we've been looking at an expository study in, on covenant in our Sunday school lessons and through our Sunday school me or our messages on Sunday morning. Expository uh, study is when you take an idea and you look at every scripture and you turn it around and you spend many, many months just looking at an idea and we have been looking at covenant for a long time, we're about finished, and we've enjoyed the study. But I thought today I would kind of break from an expository study on covenant to kind of do a topical message today, because we live in topical times. Sometimes uh, our society and government and just tragedy dictates that we break from what we're doing and talk about this. It was about this time last week that a gunman went through the door of a small church that looked like New Hope 15 years ago and opened fire on a group of believers gathering for worship, singing praises to God like we just sing to God, hearing the pastor speak like we hear our pastor speak every morning, and we're gunned down. And everybody in the church, all the news media have really one name on their mind. You look at any news article or any news program, you hear the name Jesus Christ lifted up, and I thank God for the testimony of, of Sutherland Springs Baptist Church and how they were lifting up Jesus even in the, in the face of unspeakable tragedy. But everybody who goes to church here today, we talked about this a little Wednesday night, and if you're my Wednesday night crowd, you may hear some the same themes this morning, is this. Is it worth it? Is it worth being here today? Knowing what could happen, knowing that we live in a hostile society, is it worth it? We're reminded this week that we live in hostile times. That the world really is and always has been hostile to Christians. That we kind of take for granted because we have wonderful veterans, wonderful police, wonderful firemen who protect us and keep us safe. But... Not all of us can be saved all the time. So everyone in America who's gone to church this morning, whether you believe it or not, subconsciously so you're sitting in this pew and you're asking your question to yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth me sitting in this pew? Is it worth me praising, my, praising God through song? Is it worth me to, to hear the preacher and then to come here? Is this worth my life? And so I praise God that Southern Springs found its testimony in the midst of unspeakable tragedy, that their feet found their doctrine. Their feet found their theology. And they are praising and worshiping Jesus even today as they did last week. And so, as we look at the topical message and some scripture today, I want you to kind of look at this, that the world has always been hostile toward Christians. And this is Christianity 101. So I don't want us to be held by, to be a prisoner of the moment. And I don't want us to be held hostage by what our government and what other churches are doing. But how does the church throughout the ages dealt with persecution? How has the church throughout the ages dealt with suffering? And how should we respond? And the pastor said it perfectly in the pastoral prayer. That we not lean on our own understanding. That we lean on God and God alone. And the best way to lean on God and God alone is to go to the Scriptures. And that's what we're going to do today. That Jesus never was tricking us. He was very transparent in what it took to follow Him and what might happen if you followed Christ. There are great consequences to being a Christian. 
Consequence one is that we die and go to heaven. Our sins are forgiven. That we weren't enemies of God now that we are friends of God. But in this world, there are, there are hostile consequences sometimes to what we believe. And because we live in the safest uh, country, sometimes the safest state, sometimes the safest neighborhood in the world, we forget that we have been unsafe before and that the world is very hostile to, uh, to Christians. Christianity 101 today is what I'm calling this. These are things that we have believed and our, our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago believed as they were starting the church about suffering. And this is the thing that Jesus told us to expect as believers. So let's look at a transparent God. Jesus comes and he begins to teach on what discipleship is. And one thing he's going to say is, before you come to me and before that you become my disciple, I want you to count the cost. Is it worth it? He says, a builder will never start a project before counting the cost to see if he can finish the project. So Jesus is always going to ask us to count the cost of discipleship. Is it worth your life? Because it may take your life. And look at what Jesus says about this world and being his disciple. John 16, 33. You can look at that right behind me as well. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome this world. So coming to Jesus, he's not trying to pull the wool over our eyes, he's being very transparent, saying, in this world you will have trouble, you will have suffering, you will have tribulation, but the promise is that I have overcome the world. Look at what else Jesus says. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, this world would love its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember, the, the word that I have said to you, a slave is not greater than its master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. That we are not greater than our master, that this world is always going to be hostile to Christians, and in America we have experienced a reasonable amount of safety for a long time, but we know just through Bible studies in our home groups about the martyrs across the world in Syria and Egypt and Iraq and Iran, ISIS coming through and killing Christians simply for uh, being Christians. This is nothing new. Nothing new. This has happened since the first day of the church. That Stephen was killed and death will happen throughout because Christian, the world will always be hostile towards Christians. Look at what Jesus says to us in Matthew 16, 24. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That as Christians, when we take up our cross, we have to always remember that that cross is an instrument of death. It's not something we hang around our neck. It's not just a lovely wall decoration. That it is an instrument of death, reminding us that discipleship and following Jesus in this life can be very costly. And Jesus says, if it cost me my life, then it might cost you yours. So we have to count the cost and ask ourselves, is it worth it? It is a great question to ask. It's something we should all ask. Is he worth it? Is Christ worth it? Is he worth my life? Is he worth my possessions? Is he worth my reputation? Is he worth it? Keep that in the back of your mind. Here's what Paul says to a young pastor. He says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And here's what Paul goes on to say in that passage. That worthless men will grow from bad to worse. And we've even seen this in our own time that 20 years ago, we didn't see a lot of church shootings and, and mass shootings, but we are seeing worthless men grow from bad to worse. We looked at this on Wednesday nights in Revelation. How men without the Holy Spirit do unspeakable, hurtful, murderous things. And we have to be careful that we not get entitled to safety and entitled to being safe. That all those who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted. <coughs> Look at what Peter says. By the way, Peter would also die for Christ. The famous 
Peter is famously for saying, looking at the cross, and they're about to crucify him, saying, I am not worthy to die like my Savior. Hang my cross upside down, point my feet to the air, and my head to the ground. <laughs> Found it worthy to die for Christ. But look what he says in his letter. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12-19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may resort, re rejoice in exaltation. So he says, don't act like when suffering comes upon you and persecution comes upon, upon you as if something strange were happening to you. Didn't Jesus say all those who are, live God in lives will be persecuted? Didn't He say that you were going to carry a cross? Didn't He say that you were going to be persecuted? And in this life, you will have trouble. He said all of those things. So don't pretend that when these things happen that something strange is happening because Jesus told us these things were going to happen. He goes on to say this, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if with great difficulty the righteous are saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who also <laughs> suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That we are to be as innocent as lambs, as innocent as doves, and if we suffer as a church, don't let us suffer because we're murderers. Don't let us suffer because we're liars or, or troublemakers. Don't let us suffer in sin. But if we suffer as a church, let us suffer together for doing the right thing and standing on the promises of God, standing on Scripture, leaning into His life, and yes, taking up our cross and following Him. One of my last verses today is going to be this when we look at some other things. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 21. I read this Wednesday night. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps. Christ suffered that we might have an example of suffering. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And soldiers are coming to, attack, to uh, come and arrest Jesus. And Peter takes out the sword, and he's going to kill the guy who's going to arrest Jesus. He misses and cuts off the soldier's ear, Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on his head. But Jesus rebukes Peter, saying, Don't you know, Peter, that at any moment I could call 72,000 angels to rescue me from this moment? But I have to go to the cross. I have to spill my blood for the salvation of the world. And here's Peter, who is now writing a letter, the great pastor saying that Christ Jesus suffered that we might have an example on what it is to suffer. He says this, He who committed no sin, Jesus was found innocent, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. We know this about Jesus' example of suffering. He's arrested in the garden. He could have called 72,000 angels to come and rescue him from that moment. He did not. He's on trial, and people are hurling insults at him, and he remained quiet. They breathe threats around him. He's God Almighty. He could escape any time. He said the cross was worth it. That your life was worth it. My life was worth all the threats, all the name calling, all the suffering. That our life was worth it. And he went to the cross and laid on his altar and died for all of us. And Jesus is saying in return, is my life worth it? Can you, can you withstand threats? Can you withstand suffering? Can you withstand persecution? Am I worth it? Will you take up your cross 
and follow me. And so, in the Bible, you're going to see a word a lot in the Old Testament. The word altar. We studied the word altar a lot when we were looking at the book of Leviticus on Wednesday night. But we see an altar even in the life of Abraham. God tells Abraham in his old age, he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the one you love, and go to the mountain that I tell you and sacrifice him there. And so Abraham takes his son, they're going up the mountain, and Isaac, his son, begins asking, Lord, or Father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where, where is the lamb? And, and God said, or Abraham says, the Lord himself will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb. Well, we know that he ties Isaac to the altar and he's going to kill his son because God told him to. And then God says, no, Abraham, now I know that you have faith in your son, or in me, because you were willing to sacrifice your son. Look in the thicket. There's not a lamb, but there's a ram in the thicket. Take that and, put, and, and sacrifice that ram in the place of your son. We know that in the altar in Leviticus, that the priest would, would serve the people in, in Israel, and Israel would bring their lamb to the priest to be sacrificed for the remission of their sins. And the way that would go was you would lay your hand as a sinner on the head of the lamb, symbolically transferring your sin to this lamb, and the priest would kill this lamb, spilling its blood, so that this lamb would die in the place of the sinner in the Old Testament. Let's fast forward to Jesus. John, the Baptist, is baptizing people. Jesus is 30 years old. And he sees Jesus walking up to him to get baptized. And listen to what John says. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Fast forward three years later. What does Jesus do? He is the Lamb of God going into Jerusalem, being reviled. People are hurling threats at him. He is suffering. He goes to the cross. The Bible says he embraced the cross, despising the shame. And the cross became Jesus' altar. He laid on the cross, his altar, and the lamb that was going to die in the place of Isaac is now on the cross. And Jesus sheds his blood and spills his life for you and me. It cost Jesus his life. This message cost Jesus his life. Now I want you to look at what he asked us to do in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Right behind me. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So you and I are following the example of our, our great God, and the example of our great Savior. The Israelites brought their land. God provided us a land. And He asked us to be sacrifices, to be living in holy sacrifices. So you know what the mindset of Christians is even today in the, in the face of unspeakable tragedy and even anger on our part is that we are always dying on the altar. Every day when you wake up as a believer, you are hopping back onto your altar saying, crucify me. Let me crucify the flesh. This is the language of scripture. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives within me. Now the life that I now live in the flesh and the body I live for the Son of God. So you and I as Christians, we give up everything. We push all of our chips in on Jesus Christ. So our possessions are Christ, sacrificed on the altar. Our reputations are sacrificed on the altar. And yes, sometimes our very lives are sacrificed on the altar. Yes, being in here is worth it. Yes, being in here may cost our lives. And it's always been so. And Jesus told us, don't be surprised that these bad things are happening because worthless men grow from evil to worse. And so we should expect persecution, even though we haven't expected it in the past. So let me fast forward to my last four points today. On Wednesday nights, we've been looking at Revelation. And Revelation for us the last couple of weeks has been very topical. We've been looking at the sealed judgments and how God wins in the end, as the pastor has been saying. And the fifth sealed judgment... John sees these martyrs underneath the altar in heaven and before the throne of God. Now these martyrs represent men and women who have been killed for Christ from the first day the church began to the last day the church ends in Revelation and martyrs through the great tribulation. And in fact, those, some of the, pe the people who were in Sutherland Springs Church last Sunday are now under the throne 
under the altar. Now I want you to notice where they're at. They're not before the throne. They are under the altar. That altar of sacrifice. It tells us this, that these men and women, under the altar in heaven, under the fifth seal of judgment, sacrificed to their, their lives for Christ. And listen to what they're doing. They're praying. They're praying. And what are they praying? They're praying some of the same things that you and I prayed this week. Or they're thinking some of the same things that you and I thought this week. How long, O oh Lord, will you hold back your wrath upon men who are upon the earth? How long will you not avenge our blood? And here's what Jesus says. Wait just a little longer. Not forever. You don't have to wait forever. Wait just a little longer. Because there are some who are still on the earth who are going to die for the gospel and they have not died yet. So even in Revelation, Jesus is saying there are some of us who will die for this message, that will die for Christ, that will take up our cross and not just symbolically die, but really, really <coughs> die. And they're under the altar. And Jesus says, wait just a little longer. And what we know about Revelation is the wrath of God does come. The wrath of God does come upon the sons of disobedience. But never forget that in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 5, it tells us to look for our hero, who is Jesus Christ. It tells us to look for our hero. And it says, John says, who am I looking for? And the angel goes, you're looking for a lion. You're looking for a lion. And it begins looking for this lion. And the next verse says, oh, and behold, I didn't see a lion. I saw a lamb. I saw a lamb like it's been slain, like it's been sacrificed. And this is Jesus Christ. But there's also something else about this lamb that has been sacrificed on the altar that is also true. It is a lamb that has been sacrificed, but it's also standing. It's also standing. Symbol saying this, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was slaughtered on that altar as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But he is standing because he was victorious over the slaughter, he was victorious over death, and he gets the last word. The people at Sullivan Springs Church who were Christians and who, who died as martyrs on their altar are standing today. Why? They were slaughtered. But their Savior also stands. Because Christ resurrected, you and I will also resurrect. That you and I have hope. And so when there's a wall between the earth and glory. And on this side of that wall on the earth, we see stuff like this, and rightly so, we go, what a tragedy. And we look at this, this unspeakable heartbreak. But on the other side of the wall in glory, the martyrs throughout the ages are saying, what a privilege. What a privilege. I always think about the martyrs throughout the ages, some of their last words, if you were going to look at their last words, they're wonderful. Andrew, the great disciple of Jesus Christ, great friend of Jesus, great, great preacher, would see the cross and the king would say, don't you know, Andrew, if you do not stop preaching the gospel and leaning into Christ, that I'm going to crucify you on that cross? And Andrew looks at him and says, if I'd have been afraid of the cross, I would not have preached it all this year. Peter found himself unworthy to die like his Savior. Many of the people who died under Nero, who were caught on fire, thank you for counting me worthy that it is a worthy thing to be in this room today. It is a worthy thing to be called by Christ into salvation. It is a worthy thing to take up your cross. It is a worthy thing to suffer and to have threats thrown at you and to, and to be here because Christ is worth it. But Christ is worth it, you know why? Because 2,000 years ago, He said you were worth it. He said you were worth it. You were worth all the threats. You were worth all the suffering. You were worth all the sacrifice. And he laid on his altar on a cross and died for our sins, breathing forgiveness for us all. You were worth it. Now the question is always at us. Is he worth it? Is he worth our lives? Is he worth our time? Is he worth our money? Is he worth our possessions, reputation? Is he worth it? And I hope that your answer is yes, he is worth it. At this time, every service, we usually have a thing called a time of response or a time of invitation. But you know what they used to call it, right? Altar call. They used to call it altar call. Are you willing to climb up on your altar and say once again, Christ, I crawl on my altar.
Take my life from me. Make my crucify my desires and make my desires your desires. Crucify my life and make my life hidden in yours. That we used to call it altar call. That once again I'm crawling up on my altar to sacrifice myself to Jesus Christ. Because everything I have is His. My blood, my sweat, my tears, my reputation, my family, my possessions, my job, everything belongs to Christ. And I lay on the altar to be sacrificed unto Him. It's called altar call. And so right now I'm going to ask you to stand for altar call. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time we can get together. To take a time away from our expository study to look at what's really going on in the world. It's uncomfortable for some of us sometimes. They were so geared on being the hero sometimes and thinking of what we would do in that situation and that Christ is not really calling us to be heroes, but sacrifices. And really, the greatest heroes in the Bible are those who sacrificed. We look at Hebrews chapter 11, and we see those who died for Christ, that some will put far armies to flight. Some will have to do great miracles, but some will lean into the gospel, and they will be beheaded, and they will be imprisoned. And they will be reviled. And your word says in Hebrews that these men and women who died, died for your glory, and the world was not worthy of them. We thank you so much that you are not just a lamb who has been slain that is standing. But you are also a lion. We praise you, God, that you're not also a lion, but that you are a shepherd. And we praise you, God, that you're not just a shepherd, but that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the name above all names, that your name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so today, as we have altar call, let us once again crawl up into that surface and say, Lord, take my life. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And this life that I now live in the flesh, I live for the Son of God as my sacrifice. Or sometimes we forget that we are sacrifices. We have another gospel out there that says that you want us to be safe. You want us to be rich. And you want us to be healthy. That's foolishness. Foolishness to those that are dying. Help us to put it all in the line. All our chips in on Jesus. Well, I pray that there's someone here who has heard about you today crawling up on your cross and dying for them because they are worth it. Would this very moment, by your Holy Spirit's prompting, decide in their heart that you are worth it and come down and talk to our pastor and trust you as personal Lord and Savior. I pray that there's someone here who does not have a church body and is looking for a group of believers that are going to say you're worth it and it's worth being here, that they would join this body. Saying, I'll be here Sundays. I'll give my life, blood, and sweat, and tears to Christ because He is worth it. Maybe there's someone in here who's going through suffering on their own. And, and they thought that you had been mad at them, God. That you were punishing them. But didn't know that suffering was just a byproduct and a result of living in a hostile world. Father, I pray that they would come down and talk to the pastor that they would get encouragement they would get prayer they would get a hug because covenant says this you will never leave us or forsake us even though that we are sinners and we all go astray and we've fallen short of the glory of God that you will never leave us or forsake us that you are continually reminding us through covenant that you love us and your cross says that you believed we were worth it thank you for your cross Thank you for your resurrection. You come as we sing.